Well, good evening and welcome to this live stream event on a rather soggy February evening. Thank you very much for spending some time with us. Martin North from Digital Finance Analytics here. Great to have you with us. We're going to have a very interesting economically centred conversation this evening. Before I bring Leith in, let me just remind you that uh, as normal, of course, we don't provide specific financial or legal or economic advice. It's a general conversation only. Do please play nice in the chat room. We do moderate the stream. Do encourage cross chat, though. It's some um, part of uh, the reason we run these live shows is so you can express your views and opinions. So uh, feel free. 22nd of February today. So if you're watching and replay, that's the date this was recorded. Use that walk the world to get my attention. Uh, it's the best way to make sure that uh, your question gets into my queue. And I've also enabled Super Chat, which means that you can get your question to the top of the list or indeed make a contribution to the running of the show, which is always greatly appreciated. And I want to say thanks for those who have already made a contribution this evening. Greatly appreciated. Thank you very much. Right. Well, without further ado, let me see whether I can bring Leith in. Leith, you there? I am. Hello, everyone. G'day, Martin. Thanks Good. for having me on again. Yeah, great to have you back on again. I just thought it was... I need an economist, right? I need an economist with a good point of view on things. And I thought, I know. <laughs> because let's face it, we have political questions, we have uh, interest rate questions, we have housing questions, we have rising petrol price. You know, well, actually, pretty much every way you look, things are falling off the perch. That's right. Yeah, well, certainly uh, life's getting a little bit more expensive for everyone. Um, look, look, full disclosure, I haven't driven a car for two months, I had neck, neck surgery. So um, uh, so I actually had to look up to see what the petrol price was before we went on air because uh, I'd heard it gone up, but I didn't actually realise just how much it had gone up. And I, Struth, it's hit uh, $1.90 in uh, in Sydney at the moment, which is according to the ACCC. So that was a bit of a shock. Um, but uh, And also, I've got to say, unlike um, for once, we've got one up on Sydney because uh, I'm obviously taping from Melbourne and we've had the most spectacular summer. Uh, it's rained like twice, I think, since uh, since the start of summer. It's blue skies. It's warm. Uh, so if you see if you so if you see a few beads of sweat going down my forehead, it's because it's a hot summer night. Right. Well, we've certainly got a soggy summer night here. I mean, the, the amount of rain we've had this year has been absolutely ridiculous. So there you go. Um, now, people probably will know you, Leith, but for those who don't, just give us the um, uh, fifty thousand view of of you, who you are, where you come from, and your um, approach to economics. Yeah, well, uh, thanks for that. I'm an economist. Um, I worked at the Australian Treasury in the early 2000s for three years. Uh, left there, went for went and worked for the uh, Victorian Treasury for a year. Uh, then went uh, then then went to the dark side. Worked for Goldman Sachs for five years. And about halfway through that, I was very bored, I must say. And I wasn't working in economics then. I was working in uh, like regulatory capital, so uh, capital adequacy type stuff. And um, I got a little bit bored, so on the side, I started up a blog, a personal blog, just to basically fill in the hours and keep my sort of brain tuned in on economics. Um, through that blog, I met David Llewellyn Smith, who also had a blog. And then uh, we started catching up for lunch, lunches, et cetera, and beers and whatever. And Dave lived in Melbourne, lives in Melbourne as well. And then one day, uh, we came up with the idea of um, merging our blogs into a super blog called Macro Business, and that was 10 years ago. And... 10 years on, um, it's still going strong. So I pretty much um, do that full time as well as work with uh, Nucleus Wealth as their chief economist. Uh, so that's uh, that. That's me in a, uh, a nutshell. Um, I tend to, I gave myself the moniker of the unconventional economist back in the day. Um, the reason why I picked that was, well, it's because I tried about 10 other different names and they were already taken. But And this was like number 11 on the list or whatever. And um, But I think it's actually uh, quite fitting. Uh, I tend to take a different perspective to most of the economists out there. Um, I don't do it on purpose. It just, I seem to have different views. And and that view was kind of born while I was at Treasury when I used to look around a bit and go, well, hang on, why are we doing this? Why are we doing that? Uh, why, you know, for example, we had the, the three P's framework of population participation and productivity. Well, I used to look at that and go, well, why, why, why do we have to have population growth? Why can't we just have the other two? Uh, all those sorts of questions. And I guess over uh, a 10 year, period of writing for macro business um yeah my thoughts have been uh you know become a bit more uh you know wedded in my views and i tend to go against a lot of the um economic mainstream and a lot of these issues which um my personal view of the economics profession is that it's it's largely corrupted um because a lot of economists obviously work for industry organizations who benefit benefit from said policy so it's often not uh independent and um 
and I like to call that out. Right. And I'll be interested um, in terms of the major policy areas where your view of economics will be different from the mainstream guys, because I reckon there are probably three or four that jump out. But, but what would you say was the sort of linchpin argument? Yeah, look, um, probably the, the, the main one, and, and I always, it's always easy to point to the thing that's the most current. And the, and the, the, the issue I'm fighting pretty, fighting the hardest at the moment is this obsession we've got with, um, with, with running a really high population growth slash immigration policy. Um, we, we've just had this two year period over the pandemic when Australia's, Australia's immigration uh, intake, which for 15 years had ran at the highest level in history, but it, it got tripled, it got uh, more than doubled in the early 2000s or mid 2000s. And um, when the pandemic hit, we actually had a loss of immigration. And my view is it's actually led to some good, um, good outcomes for Australia. Uh, yet the, the policy makers that be, the politicians, the industry groups, pretty much everyone wants to go back to the old system we had in the previous 15 years when it was clearly a failure. We just had the, I talked about this with you last time, um, the last decade was the worst decade for living standards in at least 60 years of data, of records. And we had the lowest per capita GDP growth, we had the lowest per capita disposable income growth, um, household disposable income growth. We had, the low, we, we had you know, crumbling productivity. Um, we had an erosion of living standards across the board, you know, whether it's people being forced to live in shoebox apartments, spending longer time stuck in traffic, having to pay tolls everywhere they go. Uh, you know, pretty much everywhere you look, we had this um, dilution of living standards over the last decade, which wasn't purely caused by excessive levels of population growth, but uh, immigration, but was, but certainly that was a contributor. And yet we've just had the pandemic, we had this two year pause. We've got a taste of what it was, what, you know, what it could be like. And yet all the policymakers want to return to that same stupid model that didn't work. Um, so I've, I guess that's the main issue at the moment that comes straight to my mind because I've been fighting it uh, so hard. It's kind of my, uh, you know, the issue I'm going to die on a hill on uh, at the moment. And, and previously there's been other ones. I used to fight hard on negative gearing, but, you know, now that now that that's, um, that policy's dead in the water, I don't really bother anymore because it's sort of a failed cause. Um, I've been fighting pretty hard for years on trying to get anti-money laundering uh, legislation, um, you know, on, on Australian property. So just if you don't, I'll, I'll just go on a quick insight on that. When I worked at the Australian Treasury all the way back in 2003, I worked in this area called the International Economy Division. And just over the partition was this other group called the International Finance Division. And I was literally, you know, two feet away from them. And these guys were trying to get through, like, like Australia just signed on to these global anti-money laundering rules which was supposed to come into effect in 2006. We're now in 2022, and Australia is one of just a couple countries that still hasn't signed on to this agreement. We've had about five different consultation periods under multiple different governments, whether it's Labor or Liberal, and yet Australia is one of the few countries that will not uh, implement anti-money laundering rules pertaining to property. And what it's done is it's basically left Australia as a safe haven for dirty money. Um, and we've had the head of Transparency, Transparency International call us out, the head of the Financial Action Task Force, which is the global regulator, call us out. And, you know, Labor, Liberal, doesn't matter. Neither of them have done it. And it's about time we do it. And every time that we're about, uh, the government's about to sign on to this, the real estate lobby, the accountants, the lawyers who will be impacted by these laws, kick up a stink and the, uh, and, 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 you know, and the rules get canned. So I'm hoping that, um, that the Labor Party assuming they win the upcoming election, which looks pretty likely, will finally have, have the have the guts to actually, um, you know, implement that policy. But, yeah, that those are just two of a number of areas I've been, you know, battling against, I guess, for years. Uh, so one of the other questions I uh, wrestle with a lot is the debt question, right? Household debt is very, very high in Australia. Government debt is not as high as some other countries. Um, so do you think that's a problem or do you think that's um, a, a manageable problem? Oh, so, well, it's manageable if we keep uh, credit interest rates. So I think I talked to you last time. Um, the way I think it's going to play out in the next, uh, we can get into this more, obviously, more detail is we're going to have a period of rising interest rates. It looks inevitable. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if the you know, the RBA kicks up interest rates a little bit in the next year or so. I don't think it's going to come as quickly as um, you know, most economists think. And I'll explain that uh, if you want now or later uh, why. But um so what I think will happen is the RBA will, will, will ratchet up interest rates, you know, 
could be 0.75, who knows. But because we've got such a high load of debt, we'll, we'll end up having a housing correction. Uh, might only be 10%, uh, which is kind of seems to be what happened the last couple of times. But then that'll be enough to then spook the RBA who will then come back and cut interest rates again. And potentially next time, uh, instead of bottoming out at 0.1%, I think it's in every like in every likelihood that the RBA might actually go into negative rates. Um, so effectively, they'll uh, they'll follow what the ECB's done and what a few other places have done. They'll actually pay banks to lend. Uh, so at the moment, you might be able to get it, say, a, a variable mortgage rate for two percent if you can shop around. Uh, what this will effectively mean is that um, if the RBA starts paying the banks to lend, you might be able to get a mortgage for one and a half percent, and then one percent. So I think that's. That's what will happen. We'll go through this cycle where rates will rise a bit, property prices will fall, RBO will get spooked, back to the races. And the whole the whole debt uh, issue is obviously, um, I guess, sustainable as long as you keep manipulating the market like this, which, to be honest with you, there's a lot they can keep doing to keep manipulating the market. So, uh, you know, who knows? This, we, we could be having this chat in, in 10 years, except the cash rate by then will be minus 1% one, 1 or something. Uh, by that stage, who knows? Yeah, and, um, I, and I think my perspective is very similar too, that there will be a, a, a slight increase in rates, but nothing like the 2 or 3% that the markets are, you know, are predicting. Got to ask yourself, well, why is it the markets are actually taking that view, right? Well, maybe they've got a vested interest in pushing that particular line. Yeah, well, I mean, if you, know, if you think that through, if, 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 they, if the rates actually went up to, the cash rate went to 3% or whatever, like the market's predicting, we would get an absolutely monumental house price crash. And, 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 and there's no doubt about that because... Um, you know, at the moment, you've got these huge debt loads. You've got the um, average variable, the average variable mortgage rates about three percent ish. If you use the RBA's figures, and obviously new mortgages can be cheaper. Um, so, if the cash rate went from effectively zero to three percent, you're going to get a doubling of mortgage rates. Uh, you know, thereabouts. So, yeah, it might be off a little bit, but that's going to effectively double your debt servicing repayments, uh, which I, yeah, I don't know about you, but I don't know how many, how many Australians will be able to, uh, you know, take that in the neck without going and get, getting into some serious trouble. So um, I just don't see how it's possible to increase it that much because rates have fallen so low. You don't need uh, every 0.25 percent increase is actually a huge percentage increase in your interest bill. Uh, so you know, realistically, even a one percent increase. So if we went, if it went up to 1.1 percent or uh, if it went to 1.25 percent, that's a massive increase on the level that we're at now, and yeah. it's going to, you know, create quite a lot of headwind. So, because the debt load's so big, because rates are already so low, they can't actually increase them. A 0.25 percent increase now is worth, you know, four times what it was when interest rates were a lot higher. Well, there's a bit of a rule, um, rule of thumb, um, Lee, on my modelling. You know, I run these these surveys and stress and things. Um, a 0.5% increase in rates will put in about another 150,000 households into my category of stressed, right? Yep. And every time the rates go up, it's somewhere between 150 and 200,000 additional households. So we go from 1.5 million with, with, with cash issues, you could, be, you could be up towards 2 million, right, if, if, if rates went all the way that um, people are talking about. That can't happen because if it no. did, the economy would crash. Yeah, and, and, and there's no way that the RBA, because, you know, if the RBA did go to 3% or whatever the markets are predicting, they wouldn't do it all at once. So they'd be doing it in steps. Mm. And they get stopped out well before it gets to that, that stage. Um, so, you know, effectively, the housing market would, would be turning down, you know, vigorously. The economy would be being a, you know, a, a major pickle. And there's no way the RBA is going to keep cutting while that's going on. So I think, I think it's, you know, th th this whole notion of 3% is absurd. Uh, I can't even see it going to two percent, to be quite frank. Um, so you know, I mean, one point two five, maybe I don't know. But um, you know, I mean, obviously, you never say never. But uh, that that's a you know, famous last words. But I think anything over two percent is very you know, highly unrealistic, in my view. And would you change your view if the Fed started rapidly moving the rates up in the US? You mean people are talking seven, eight, nine? rate rises over the next year well uh, yeah i mean i doubt they do it over there so i mean i, I realize i realize inflation is obviously a lot higher over in over in the states um but again if, if they did seven eight nine increases well they'd, they'd be in a lot of strife too i think so i don't i don't think they'd even do it but but if the if the, if the fed did do that that would uh and we kept our rates 
you know, a much lower level, and that's going to put downward pressure on the Australian dollar. So uh, that could cause its own issues. It could cause uh, imported inflation to spike. Um, but I think I had this conversation with you last time. Um, I don't see. I don't think the RBA is going to hike on the back of imported inflation. It'll it'll do it on the 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 back of domestic inflation. So if wages go up. Um, so it's already said over and over again that it's not going to hike rates until wage growth picks up above 3%. And I personally can't see that happening at least until the, until the end of the year. And the, re the reason for that is twofold. Um, first of all, like I think economists now are predicting that, uh, that the next – so tomorrow's wage price data, we're going to get basically – 0.8% quarterly growth in the December quarter, 0.8% quarterly growth in the March quarter. Well, if we get that, uh, that only brings the annual um, the annual wage growth to about 2.7%. I, I worked at that today uh, for the March quarter. And, and that information won't come out to nearly June. So that still doesn't hit the 3% threshold. So if we've got another 0.8% in the September quarter, that would take us to exactly 3% annual growth, but that won't, um, but the RBA won't have that information till basically early December or late late November. So I think um, I'm, I'm suspecting interest rate rises will probably won't be on the agenda till the end of the year, uh, just based on the lag in the um, in the wage price in the wage wage price data. And the RBA said repeatedly it's not going to raise rates until it actually sees the data because it's made it's made the mistake so many times of uh, of predicting that wages are going to grow and they never do. So it actually wants to see it this time. So it's going to be reactionary. And I think based on based on that, we're probably they're probably not going to have the information to the end of the year. Um, the other issue is also we've got obviously another 0.1% uh, increase, sorry, half percent increase in superannuation guarantee mid year, and that'll also subtract from wage growth. So, um, so yeah, I mean, I, I personally don't think interest rates will be live until the end of the year, whereas I think uh, some other economists are picking sort of June now, um, just based on the flow of the data. But you know, could be wrong. The wage growth could come in a lot stronger than. Uh, than 0.8%, uh, which which might make them uh, move earlier. And I guess we'll get our first piece of the jigsaw puzzle tomorrow when the um, December quarter wage wage growth data comes out. So I'm looking forward to that one because it should, uh, should at least answer a few questions. But isn't it interesting, isn't it, how the RBA has shifted its narrative from an inflationary band to a wage growth target? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually quite like it. Uh, I mean, I, I like the fact they've done this because... There's no real point uh, raising interest rates to counter an imported inflation shock or you know something caused by supply chain because um, that's not going to solve the problem. It, it, interest rates are great for managing demand, right? So, so shift around interest rates are great for managing demand. Well, if the inflation is not coming from demand, there's really no point raising interest rates to counter it because it's not going to do anything. Um, so, but if, if if obviously wages are growing strongly, well that well that you know. That's a that's a surefire sign that you're going to get this domestically generated inflation. Uh, so I think it's a wise move, and and I think it's one of the errors they made over the last decade. Is they is is uh, if you if you look at the the RBA's wage growth forecast over the whole decade, it was like this: a hockey stick, hockey stick, hockey stick, hockey stick. Instead, it went down. So now now I think they've acknowledged that they've made these errors, these blunders for a decade, and so is the Australian Treasury. Um, and now they're going to start, wait till they actually see the data before they move. So I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing. I mean, does it really matter if you know if they move a quarter late? I don't, I don't think it does. Um, and they also seem to really want to test this notion about how far can we push the the unemployment rate down before we start getting wage growth. Um, you know, they're, they're, there's there's been previously the perception was that if uh, unemployment goes below five percent, it'll lead to you know sharp jump in wage growth. Well. That's kind of been blown out of the water, and now the RBA thinks it's probably more like four percent, and they want to test it. They want to find where that where that uh, downward threshold is. So I think it's a uh, yeah, you know, I think it's a, a decent move. I mean, you know, let, let's just see how it goes. Like, I, I mean, I, I personally want to see it because <laughs> it's you know, it's we, we, we've basically got a real time experiment going on now, and um, and I kind of want to see just how far we can get unemployment and and just what the implications are. So there's a couple of interesting questions when you start talking about the metrics, right? So is the inflation metric the real read of what's happening to real inflation in the economy? First question. What about the um, employment number? Is that a real number or is it not a real number? Because, of course, you can look at the Roy Morgan numbers and they, they're very different. 
And, and then the third thing is migration. If they do open the taps and increase migration again, isn't that going to put downward pressure on wages? Oh, absolutely. That, that, that's a beautiful Dorothy Dixon there. Because uh, you know, um, you obviously know my view on that one. Uh, I mean, which 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 of those issues would you like to tackle first? I mean, I, I, I don't mind. <laughs> well, it's they're up all to you. they're all connected, really. But yeah, let, let's let's start let's start with the metrics. Are the metrics telling the truth? Oh, for inflation. Hmm. Yeah. Look, um, I mean, the the way the RBS uh, sorry the way the ABS measures measures inflation is they they grab a basket of goods, thousands of items, and they effectively measure the price changes in those items, and they also try and adjust for quality. So. For what it is, it's I guess it's robust, um, but I mean, it, it's always a sample, right? So whenever you take a sample of stuff, it's not going to meet necessarily your your circumstances or someone else's, but it does give you, I guess, a broad gauge. And then what they tend to rely on even more is the underlying rate uh, rate of inflation, where they try and take out the most volatile items um, and just leave the less volatile stuff in the middle, and that gives you sort of a more so. So if you have a massive spike in petrol. Um, but everything else doesn't move, that's going to push up inflation. So they might discount that. And that gives you the underlying inflation rate. And the RBA wants to, uh, its trigger for interest rates is to try and keep the underlying inflation between 2 and 3%. So if it's below 2%, interest rates should get cut. If it's above 3%, they should rise. That's a sort of broad rule of thumb. Uh, at the moment, I think it's about 2.6%. So it's, uh, but it's definitely on the way up. Um, and in terms of the, the uh, so, so the inflation metric, it's okay for what it is. Uh, the, the ABS does also produce these cost of living indexes, so, which is, a, I guess, an inflation metric, but for different cohorts of the population, say so like retirees, uh, pensioners, the unemployed, employees, et cetera. Uh, that, that data comes out a few days after the CPI data, and, and that effectively measures you know, the cost of living or inflation for these broad groups. Um, nothing's ever perfect. Uh, it's okay for what it is, I guess. Uh, it obviously uh, doesn't count things that are important to a lot of people, like, for example, uh, house prices. Uh, that That's excluded. Um, so, you know, it's a little bit like GDP. If you know its limitations, it's okay for what it is. Um, but certainly not gospel. And just because the inflation rate, you know, is... is uh, is currently what 3.1 percent or something doesn't mean that your cost of living's going up 3.1 percent. You might be significantly above that, or maybe even below that. So, uh, you know, take it for what it is. Um, the unemployment rate is uh, Australia's unemployment rate is a globally defined measure. So, so we use an international standard for it. So, um, again, that's good for what it is. And what I tend to look for in the unemployment rate and also the underemployment rate, et cetera, is not really what the absolute number is. It's the, it's the change uh, and how it relates to history. So um, at the moment, the unemployment rate is 4.2%. That's probably lower than what it really is because according to the ABS, um, this last survey, which they tend to be about a year or so old, there was about a million hidden unemployed in Australia. So that's basically a million people that could work. Um, but aren't counted in the unemployment figures because they're not actively uh, looking for work. I'm sure that figures come down quite a bit now because um, we've had, you know, uh, more Australians join the workforce. Um, but and whereas the, whereas the Roy Morgan figure, which is a lot higher, which is more like I think nine percent, um, seems to count for those hidden unemployed more. So again, it's a good figure if you if you if you look at it from a historical perspective and how it's changed. It gives you a really good read, and if you look at the trends, it's really good. But as for an absolute figure, I don't think it's necessarily accurate, but it is a global standard. So it's not really ABS's fault. They're just following what the global standard is. And so it's um, so you can compare between countries, et cetera. Yeah. And that is part of the issue, isn't it? Because people try to get some comparables across different countries and therefore some standards might help. But just going back to the CPI, of course, the housing element of CPI is quite interesting, right? Because they sort of use a bit of a rental proxy. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, so so there's a thing called imputed rents. So it's basically, um, and, and even that is get some weird, uh, get some weird results. So for example, the ABS's um, rental growth data suggests that rents are basically growing at their pretty close to their slowest rate in history, like almost experiencing no growth. No growth. Whereas if you use any of the private data providers like CoreLogic or uh, Domain or SQM, they're all experiencing double digit rental growth. So you've got this massive disconnect. And I think the reason for that is um, the private providers measure, um, they measure advertised rents. So, so rents that are 
currently on the market. The, the new rentals ones, that are currently on the market. Yeah, yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Basically, so it's sort of like a stock versus flow. Yep. Um, so the private providers are doing uh, doing a what, what's currently available for rent and how that's the price has gone up. Whereas the ABS measures rents across the whole market. So there's you know uh, five million renters out there. They'll be measuring rents on those five million properties, not the fifty thousand that are currently advertised. So it do, it does lead to some some weird results, and because of that, the the ABS's rental data tends to be very much lagged. Uh, so it's still really weak when um, when it's actually rocketed in the last year across the private private indexes. So uh, again, you know, the data is not perfect, but if you know those sorts of limitations, whatever, it's okay. And of course, the same as in the US, right? So their rental data, because recent rents have moved up, but the overall um, CPI number is still not showing that yet. So that's why people are saying in the US the, the CPI will go higher because there's a there's a bunch of rents to flow through into the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. A, a, a lot of lag. So so obviously the the ABS measures uh, prices of people who are in rents who are renting currently, and obviously you know their their, their rental agreements might take a year to come up. So um, there should be this lagged effect where the rents that roll off start to actually get reflected like they are in the private providers. So, so there is this lag effect. Um, and at the moment, it's not being picked up in the, the, uh, the CPI data, which means it's not being picked up in Australia's inflation data. Yeah. Okay. So basically what we're saying is, well, the, you know, the numbers are the numbers and it's the movements that's actually probably more uh, helpful rather than the absolutes, which is quite a good, a good sort of observation. But yeah. there are some limitations in those numbers. Um, but they are what they are. Um, I want to just underscore one of the things you said a little while ago. The lived experience of individual households won't necessarily correlate to those indices. No, absolutely not. Because you know, it, it, everyone's, um, everyone's circumstances are different. If you're, if you're obviously uh, you know, indebted to the eyeballs, you're a, you're a recent home buyer, you've got a massive mortgage, et cetera, you've got kids, you know, young kids at school, you're paying childcare, blah, blah, blah. Your, your circumstance is going to be a lot different to mine. I'm 44 years old, my kids are older. I've been living in my house for you know, a decade or so and paid off a lot of it, et cetera. So you know, all, all our circumstances are different and my circumstances are different to my parents who fully own their house uh, and are basically living the sort of um, you know, retiree lifestyle. So um, you know, we're all different. Uh, the, the ABS does try and account for that with its, you know, cost of living indices to a degree. But even then, you know, I, I, um, yeah, sure, I'm employed and I'm middle aged, but doesn't mean I'm I perfectly fit into that employee household, you know, cohort, which is one of the sort of five areas they have. So um, look, it's just a broad tracker for the economy. It's a bit like um, body mass index, for example. Um, you know, it's a it, it's great for a population average, but it's useless for you individually. So it's kind of um, just sort of look at it like that. And I guess the point I want to make there is that all these indices have the same characteristics. You could say the same about the house price indices, right? People need to understand the limitations of these indices, right? What I get frustrated about is a way so many people seem to grab them and then try and build a whole edifice in the sand, right, off the movements in the index, right, without understanding some of the limitations that's driving the inputs yeah for sure and 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 obviously with the with the house price indices you, you know which one are we talking about uh you've got the, the abs and and the domain one uses a different um you know methodology to core logic which used a different methodology to residex um which is now owned by core logic uh, so you know it, um they should all move they, they all kind of move over time in a similar way but they're but they do give different results in a given quarter or, um, you know, even in a given year and across different markets. So it's all, you know, it's all, uh, not, nothing, none of this stuff's perfect. And it's just because I live in Melbourne, just because Melbourne's, you know, property prices are flatlining now doesn't mean they're flatlining in my suburb. I, got, I couldn't tell you if they are or not. I don't know. But, um, you know, because Melbourne's a city of 5.2 million people. So, uh, you know, and... And probably uh, one and a half to two million dwellings. So it's all, um, yeah, it's just broad averages. Just take it all with a grain of salt. <laughs> but that also means you have to take with a grain of salt all of the mainstream economists who come up with all of their predictions of price movements and you know their latest analysis of all of the stuff coming out of the ABS. Th this whole industry, <laughs> or if you like, 
you know, parsing the information and just, you know, making up a story seems to me to keep a lot of people employed. <laughs> Maybe that's the, that's the employment uh, um, strategy, but does it really help? Yeah, look, there's a lot of noise uh, with with everything, really. Uh, and, and unfortunately, a lot of, as we know, a lot of um, the narrative is set by lobby groups and vested interests. And uh, unfortunately, my profession um, is impacted a lot by lobby groups and vested interests. I mean, how many economists are there working for industry groups, et cetera, that just parrot whatever the industry group wants? Yeah. Um, that's just the way it is. And, it, and it's a, similar across a lot of industries. So, you know, I guess you've got to take in, anything you read with a grain of salt, and that includes what I write. You know, you shouldn't take mine, everything I write as uh, gospel. That's a lot of it's my opinion. Mm. I try and base it on fact, and it's not always right. But, um, yeah, so, you know, we should, uh, everyone should view everything with a skeptical lens. I think that's very, very good advice. And, you know, what, again, what I try to do here is just show different views, different opinions, different voices, as it were, because I want people to make better decisions themselves rather than just grabbing the one off the shelf and saying, well, you know, because that guy said it or that guy said it or that channel said it, it must be right. Um, because there's always more complexity, you know, and as I sometimes say, averages mask. You have to go granular to really understand what's going on. You also have to understand the context of, the, of these things too. And, 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 on, yeah. and on context, let me just now go directly to this question, right? So, yep. you know, wages growth, right, um, may come up, but migration, if migration is increased like they want it and they want a big number, isn't, going to go, isn't that going in the reverse direction? Isn't that going to put downward pressure back on wages again? Oh, totally. Look, the, the Morrison government said in late November it wants 200,000 uh, foreign workers in Australia by July. So we've already seen, um, well, the preliminary data, there's no official data out, but I've read in the AFR, there's been pronouncements by um, by the immigration minister that there's already been tens of thousands of, you know, students and working holiday makers and backpackers, et cetera, arrive. So, you know, it's pretty basic economics that if that if, um, that if if we're going to flood the, the labour market with a whole bunch of foreign workers, well, that's going to increase the unemployment rate, uh, other things equal, and, um, and of course, put do downward pressure on uh, on wages. And look, this is exactly what the RBA has been spoken for years. They, they use this thing called the Phillips curve, which basically says the lower the unemployment rate goes, the higher wages should go. So there should be this inverse relationship. And so for anyone to try and deny that, uh, that rebooting big Australia immigration um, won't put downward, pre uh, won't increase the unemployment rate and put down pressure on wages is basically lying. Uh, and the and the data is the data is as clear as day uh, from the la ABS labour market uh, accounts. So I, I don't know. Should we go through that now? I've um, I've done a few charts just to highlight the point. And the reason why I've been banging on about this is um, and taking it on so vigorously is because I've been arguing this point for eight years and has basically been laughed at by economists or you know called an, an idiot and blah 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 and uh, etc. So. Um, I think that's the last slide. The uh, oh, okay. Let me sorry. Let me just. Um, that's all right. No worries. Move my pointer there. Whoops. There's only. There you go. It, okay, I'll just tell everyone this isn't a chart fest, so it's not going to sit here for <laughs> next next hour going through charts. But <laughs> basically, what, what I want to show is Australia's unemployment and underemployment rate is basically tracking near 14 year low. So um, the only the underemployment rate rose marginally last. Uh, in in uh, in January because of the Omicron outbreak, but uh, it's effectively travelling, uh, you know, tracking a close to its lowest level since November two thousand eight, and so is the unemployment rate. So, unemployment rate is currently at four point two percent. The underemployment rates at six point seven percent. Both are tracking near their lowest level since two thousand and eight. Now, this has happened. This has all come about despite the fact that Australia's jobs growth, despite what they all tell you is lagging way behind the pre-COVID trend, which you can see in the left-hand chart. So despite all this stimulus, look, the stimulus was great. There's no doubt about it. I mean, it was wasteful, a lot of it. But in terms of uh, filling the hole left by lockdowns and restrictions, et cetera, it did do its job. Uh, it, it, it's, it's boosted employment. It stopped us from uh, effectively you know, going into, into a depression. But this whole notion that it somehow put the economy on a higher trajectory than it was pre-COVID is complete rubbish. And that's shown by this chart in the left. We've had slower jobs growth than we had pre-COVID. Clearly, it's it's you know it's 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 obvious it's there. Yet the unemployment rate and the underemployment rate has fallen to a, close to its lowest level in 14 years. Um, if you don't mind, just go next next uh, slide, Martin. Now, on top of that, you know, 
an easy question to ask is, oh, that, that's because people have left the labour market. People have stopped looking. Well, that's not true because the chart on the right is the employment to population ratio. And what we've got is we've got a higher percentage of Australians working, you know, a higher percentage of the population working than has ever been the case before. So we've got more people participating in the labour market. The, the labour force participation rate, which isn't shown here, is actually higher than it was pre-COVID. At the same time, the ratio, the number of uh, unemployed and under underutilised, which is unemployed plus underemployed per job vacancy, is also the lowest on record. So we've got the situation where the jobs growth has lagged the pre-COVID trend. Unemployment and underemployment have fallen to basically 14-year lows. We've got more people in the higher percentage of the population in jobs than ever before and a tightest jobs market on record. How could that be? Right? You know, so if we skip to the next slide, this answers the question. It's because immigration turned negative. There's no doubt about it. Um, the only way you can get these things, get the unemployment and underemployment rate to fall so much when you've got crappy jobs growth is for there to be less people in the labour market um, or the labour market not to grow as quickly. And, and basically, we went from a situation uh, pre-COVID where the labour labor force grew at basically 25,000 people a month because of immigration. But since the borders have shut and we actually had negative immigration, the labour market, which is shown effectively on the right-hand side, stopped growing. So the labour supply stopped growing. So we had crappy wage growth, uh, sorry, crappy employment growth. It was still growing, but crappy. But with a stagnant labour supply means the unemployment rate falls. It's basic statistics. So by my calculations, if immigration had continued at its pre-COVID level throughout the pandemic, we'd have, we'd have um, you know, more than 450,000 more workers in the economy, migrant workers, than we do currently. And obviously that means that the unemployment rate is going to be a lot higher than it is. And we're going to have then uh, you know, less upward pressure on wages. It's basic statistics. It's undeniable. Um, yet, yet we had the RBA governor last week try and argue that it's all about stimulus. Oh, it's because of the stimulus. It's got nothing to do with immigration. We had the Grattan Institute argue the same. We had a whole bunch of other economists argue the same thing. Yet it's here in black and white in the statistics showing that the reason why the unemployment rate's fall, and the only way you can get the unemployment rate and underemployment rate to fall so much and have more people in jobs than ever before in the face of slow jobs growth is for the labour market to stop growing and to stop bringing in people. And obviously the, the flip side of that is if we go back to the big Australia immigration, um, which I think was shown in the last chart, and we go back to importing a, pro, uh, a projected 235,000 people every year, uh, which is what it says in the intergenerational report, well, Obviously, that's going to lift unemployment and put put downward pressure on rate, wages. Um, it's basic statistics, and it's shown clear, clear as day in the data. It's irrefutable, and yet we have a whole bunch of economists right across the economy, including the RBA governor, trying to trying to argue that the you know that that, that the earth is flat and, and and none of these and none of this applies. It's it's quite bizarre. Um, I've also got a chart here that so, so Gareth, uh, Gareth uh, Hutchins, I think his name is from uh, from the ABC, has done an absolutely brilliant job as well. He um, he's effect he's effectively presented the same data that I've done, but in a different way, and he's and he's shown unambiguously that the fall in the un, un, uh, the unemployment rate has been caused by the closed border. So what he's got here is the dark blue line is the growth in the in the labour force, which is basically the domestic population growth plus immigration. And the red is the jobs growth. And you can see the whole period of the big immigration uh, from 2005, effectively, up until the pandemic, um, you know, except for a little bit in the first couple of years during the mining boom, the labour force grew at a faster rate than employment growth. And what that meant is un uh, uh, the unemployment rate rose. And then since the pandemic's hit, despite the fact that we've had you know, pretty ordinary jobs growth, the big fall in labour market growth has meant the unemployment rate's fallen. So... It's effectively showing exactly the same as the same thing as what I've shown. Uh, it's irrefutable. And the flip side, again, is that if we go back to rebooting big Australia immigration, well, then you're going to end up with higher unemployment and lower wage growth. And um, I guess the other flip side of that is lower wage growth means lower interest rates. So maybe that's the whole plan after all. Um, but yeah, look, it does, it does surprise me that we have all these economists across the country trying to argue that this isn't the case when it's clear as day in the data and it is irrefutable. So I'm going to make an argument here to suggest that a lot of the people who are arguing for this um, very 
significant rise in migration is thinking about all the spare properties that are out there, you know, particularly the high rise. And wouldn't it be nice to be able to get people to buy them? So if you bring oh. a few more people in the country, you can keep the property prices high. Absolutely. And, and you can see that you can see even with the um, so obviously vested interests, you know, pull the strings of most of the economists in the country. Um, you know, if, if you work for one of these business lobby groups, you're going to be obviously, you know, singing the company hymn sheet. Uh, what gets me is you've got groups like the Grattan Institute, which are supposed to be independent or they claim they're independent. But if you actually look at their donor list, it's full of big business who are, who are also trying to argue against this stuff. Um, and it's just nonsensical. Like the Grattan Institute even had the gall to argue that um, that that immigration creates more jobs than it takes. So which using that logic, we wouldn't have had the big fall in unemployment during the during the the pandemic. And using their logic, we could just increase immigration to a million a year and we'd have no unemployment. Mm. Uh, it doesn't make sense. It's nonsensical. But these are the sorts of um, you know the, uh, arguments I have all the time with these people. And uh, you know, it's kind of frustrating, but it's also fun now that I know I'm right and I've got the data to, data to back it up. So I'm really digging the knife in. And just on the last slide there, just to complete the story, right, this is shows the um, what happened to migration, right, the significant drop, and then effectively the expectation it will return to where it was previously. That's right. And, and, and this is, you know, as usual, this is from the intergenerational report. They didn't bother to go back uh, further than 2000 because I'd love to see this same chart going back to like 1940 because <laughs> because the line would be really, really low, below 100,000 a year. Um, and then, it you know, and then magically it just jumped up in 2005 once Howard, the Howard government opened the immigration floodgates. It's never gone back. Yeah. Uh, but of course, they've cut it off at 2000 to make it look like it wasn't out of context historically mm. and to make that look like it's normal when it's not. The 15 years, 2005 to 2020, was an absolute outlier in Australia's history. Um, you know, we used to do under 100,000 and then suddenly, you know, 230, 240,000 a year became the norm. And... The, the intergeneration report, you know, predicts that it's going to go back to 235,000 a year uh, over the next 40 years. Australia is going to grow by 13.1 million people, uh, which is a 50% increase, and you know everything's going to be hunky dory. Whereas the ordinary person like you and me, who, who lives in you know uh, near Sydney or in Melbourne, in my case, knows that the population is going to double, and we're going to be living in a mega city of 10 million people with everyone living in apartments and having the standard living cut. So that's basically the lived experience. But, uh, but of course, you know, none of the big, the big Australia shields ever mention the downsides. They just talk about bigger economy, um, you know, aging population as if like immigration doesn't solve that by the way. Um, and, you know, more, more tax revenue while ignoring the costs on state governments and individuals having to pay for, you know, toll roads, et cetera, and all this expensive new infrastructure. So um, it's the sort of stuff we touched on last time, but, you know, it's very infuriating for me, uh, who's been banging on about this for eight years, to watch, to basically witness the pandemic, think we're going to get a reset, and then find out that we're not going to get a reset. We're just going to go back to business as usual, which failed so abysmally the last time around. It's um, it's a definition of insanity. Yeah, um, and, and of course, it's also just reflecting on two other things. The first is. If you think about the unemployment rate, it might be very low, but you should also think about the quality of the jobs that people have, right? Because the definition of unemployed is, you know, so, so much working or not. But it doesn't tell you about how well they're paid. It doesn't tell you how full-time or part-time the job is. And we've had a big boom in low-paid healthcare and ancillary services, for example, right? So if you look at the redistribution, I, I sometimes call it the bedpan economy. <laughs> yep, yep. I've used the same one. I, yeah, I, think, I think you and I have, uh, have, have basically uh, spun the same line uh, over many years. Yeah. It's um, the, these sort of extractive industries. Mm. Uh, it's not that you don't need them, but no. it, I, I think last time I talked about it, the um, the service, the people service in economy, I guess, is what I call it. So they're not they're not sort of um, wealth generating uh, parts of the economy. It's not like you know tradable stuff, uh, manufacturing, etc., or uh, and, you know, something you can sell overseas. It's it's, it's just um, jobs you have to service more people and it's by definition low productivity and also you know often quite low paid and it's often paid for by taxes um so yeah and, and obviously that that revenue is going to be raised somewhere else so uh yeah absolutely bedpan economy uh people service in economy um yeah whatever you want to call it dumb economy i don't know but 
you know, look, 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 I certainly don't want to disparage people who work in health. My, my wife works in health, hmm. and obviously, um, you know, we need those jobs yep. uh, with the aging population. But um, I guess you don't want to base the whole economy around. I guess is the um, is the thing. But 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 let, let me take this argument slightly further because there gets to an interesting question about how the economy works, right? And there's, there's the old idea of money flow, how fast money goes around the economy, right? And is it, is it the same dollar that's going round or are we actually multiplying the dollars that are going round? Now, there are some industries, particularly if I, I guess if you are trading with the rest of the world, that can create more dollars. So it actually does create an economic positive outcome. But there's a hell of a lot of stuff that is just shifting that same dollar around the circuit again, right? And, of course, interestingly, if you look at the supply chain numbers, uh, sorry, the um, money supply numbers, I should say, rather than supply chain numbers, they've gone way high, and that's partly because of all the government stimulus and everything else, but it hasn't necessarily created any more productivity nor any more value. No, it certainly, it certainly hasn't created more productivity. I mean, um, yeah, I, I think I, last time around I presented some charts showing that the productivity growth in Australia has been absolutely dismal. Uh, look, it's not just an Australian problem. This has happened, you know, uh, other places as well. But if the, the last decade was the worst decade for, you know, productivity growth for generations. And also, obviously, the worst decade for per capita GDP growth, the worst cap, worst, worst decade for household disposable income growth. So we effectively had this, this uh, I call it the lost decade, um, where... Australia was growing, the, you know, the pie was growing just by bringing more people and more debt, but everyone's slice of the pie wasn't getting any larger. And in fact, when you factor in all these other uh, externalities, like, you know, whether it's you're forced to live in an apartment instead of a house because prices have gone up and there's so many more people around, or you got to, you know, you're stuck in traffic all day or et cetera. Um, I'd argue that living standards actually went down last decade um, for all these sorts of reasons. So, um, you know, and, and, and a part of it's because Australia has shifted its economy to fully service-based, effectively. Like, we've got a few... Yeah, we've obviously got mining, et cetera, which will always be there. But if you strip out the mining bit, we're effectively a service-based economy, which is not... The advanced economies are always more service-based. But ours are, but, but, but our, manuf our manufacturing sector is the smallest in the OECD um, or smallest in the developed world. We've got effectively no manufacturing anymore. And we're effectively just this bring people in, sell coffees to them, sell massages to them. Like the massage joints everywhere in Melbourne. I don't know how they use them. Um, sell massages to them, build houses for them, build toll roads for them. And, and that's kind of the whole economy now. And so it, it, I often describe it as a Ponzi economy, but it sort of is because you've got to keep bringing more and more people in to produce all these BS jobs for them and, and, and to then create more demand to build more infrastructure which you only need because you brought the people in the first place it's kind of this circular i mean this crazy tail wag in the dog economy that that um that australia's got and perversely it actually makes you poorer overall in a country like australia because we we uh, we're, we're obviously very rich in natural resources and that's how we effectively pay what pay away in the world to a large degree is we, we dig stuff up we flog off our natural resources and we and you know, obviously a lot of it goes offshore because it's foreign owned, but we, we do get a lot of that back in company tax, et cetera, which then gets dis gets dispersed across the population. Obviously, if you double the population, you, you're effectively halving your mineral worth, wealth per person. So it's kind of a stupid uh, policy for a country like Australia to do. It's going to make you worse off, uh, in addition to creating more pressure on the environment, et cetera. And it's probably why countries like Norway, which is rich in natural gas, don't pursue these sorts of policies. Like, do you think, does anyone honestly believe that Norway would be richer about 10 million people instead of 5 billion? I don't think so. I don't think they think it would either. But, um, you know, for some reason, Australia's got to keep growing. We've got to keep keep growing in size and whatever and, you know, bugger the consequences. It just doesn't make sense to me. No, well, I have this um, um, thought of you have to pedal harder to try and stand still, right? Because yep. that's effectively what we're doing at the moment. And the only levers that we've got are lower interest rates, so that people can get bigger mortgages to buy more property to be able and more to... more people. <laughs> exactly. So that's the sort of the, the vicious circle here. But it's not a productive economy. Uh, do you know what? Uh, I, should, I, should, I should recoin this to two Ps. So the Treasury's got the population anticipation productivity. We should just be population property. 
with the the real two peas. I only thought about that now. I can't believe you know, you know it's taken me ten years and thought about that now. But live on air. But that but, but that's really the two peas that drives the yep. economy: population yep. and, and 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 property. Yep. So the rest of it's just you know window dressing. Um, you know the government doesn't really even try. They don't care. Well, I think of my crisis. I saw it. I think being written about New Zealand that you know, the New Zealand economy was a basically an economy that was driven as a it's a property economy with a little bit of the rest of the economy bolted on the side, right? I mean, you yeah, know, that's Bernard Hickey. Yeah. Bernard Hickey from Interest. Uh, okay, coined that. And I think it's actually a very very good point to make, right? That we've got this massive, you know, all embracing all. You know, growing property sector and more. Nearly and more. ten trillion dollars now. Yeah. Nearly ten trillion, just about to hit ten trillion. Exactly, and then of course it gets to the point where it's too big to fail. So it come back to these these shocks, right? If we did start to see significant price falls in properties, which is if if it does eventuate because of higher interest rates or just because there's less demand for property, um, that's going to put huge pressure on household budgets. The wealth effect will go negative. But it also put huge pressure on the banks, who basically are big building societies and are just basically yep. lending their books, you know, to, to generate more property um, sales and transactions and more mortgages. So this whole thing comes unglued very quickly. Then, yeah, and 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 and, and a lot, yeah, you know, a lot of that problem has been caused by the Basel Capital Accord. So back in 1988, the um, this global set of capital rules came out called the Basel Capital Accord, and effectively what it did was uh, it tried to it set globally defined um, amounts of capital banks have to hold against different kinds of risks. And what it did was it heavily biased residential property over business lending. So effectively, um, you know, I'm trying to think with the 1988 Basel, I think it was a 50% risk weighted asset. So, so effectively, you got only had to hold half as much capital for a property loan as you did a business loan. And over, over that time, Basel II came out and have actually shrunk that even more. Correct. So that now, if, um, if you're a big four bank or Macquarie, you effectively only have to hold... Uh, um, you know, your, your, your risk rating is about a quarter. So you've got to hold a quarter of the capital you've got to hold against business loans. Um, and, and this whole system, which kind of made sense at the time, if you, you know, everything should be risk-based and we should put more capital in the things that are higher risk. It all sounded all well and good, but problem is what it's done was it's made uh, lending way more biased towards non-productive assets like property over productive things like business lending. And it's effectively skewed the world's economy in the property, um, you know, in, in the property speculation. And if anything, it's gotten worse over the years because subsequent revisions to that capital accord have then brought out these, you know, allowed banks to use their internal models, which are even more generous to property lending. Um, so the whole system has been warped and you can see it in the RBA's credit statistics. So basically, you know, if you plot those back to the late eighties, which is sort of how far they go, you can see the, the proportion of lending to property versus businesses is flipped on its head. It used to be sort of two thirds business, one third property, and now it's the other way around. Uh, so, you know, I don't want to be don't want to be a conspiracy theorist, but I, I, I don't think it, it certainly wasn't a conspiracy. I don't think I think it was just um, a sort of mistake that got made. It was well intentioned at the time, but it's created this sort of global system that biases property over, you know, productive pro productive lending. And it's been taken to the extreme in Australia, unfortunately, uh, and New Zealand as well, which obviously has the same banking system. So, um, yeah, it's an unfortunate series of events. Right. And it is worth understanding the evolution of those bowel rules, right? Because the original idea was that they didn't have any capital protections on deposits particularly, so they were worried about that. So they wanted to try and find a way of, of having some equilibrium between the deposit side of the balance sheet and the rest of it so that's where it started out but then the smart bankers started pushing and pushing and pushing and basically saying well you know we can use more sophisticated financial engineering and we yep. can securitize this and we can take it off balance sheet and do all of those things and and so what we've now got is a very stressed set of bank balance sheets because of this even now right and then of course don't don't mention the derivatives, which aren't necessarily on full, full on balance sheet as well. Um, what we've lost the way. So the Baal Accords, I actually agree with you, are actually part of the problem. They're not part of the solution, yep. right? And what that basically means is that the banker's banker, you know, Bank for International Settlements, the curly bracket that sits above all the central banks, is part of the problem. Yep, and and they and they sort of you know dictate down to the 
the various countries who, who've brought in these these rules or you know, derivative of these rules, and that that's kind of got us in the you know the the situation we've got. So, um, and and you know it's pretty hard to unscramble the egg, unfortunately. Like, like uh, I often wish we could go back in time to say 2013 or something after we had the <laughs> go back that, to that the gold standard. Direction. Yeah, oh, yeah, but 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 even even 2013, yeah. I remember at the time. Um, on macro business, we were arguing really heavily for ma- for macro prudential policy to come in, yep. and um, basically the RBA said, "Oh, it's a stupid idea." APRA said, "It's a stupid idea," etc. But I sort of, I sort of wish, you know, ma- maybe if they'd gone hard on that then, uh, before we had the next credit boom, etc., that we wouldn't have leveraged up so much, and we'd have you know, a property market that's instead of being four times the size of the economy, it might be you know two times the size of the economy or two and a half times the size of the economy, so something way more manageable. But anyway, it's wishful thinking. Uh, that's um, you know what what what's done is done, and uh, we are where we are. So, and we're now sort of stuck on this um, low interest rate treadmill, where you know we're basically, I think the rest of my life we're probably going to have low interest rates. Like so whether that that might be a percent above what they are now or one and a half percent, we're going to be stuck in this kind of low interest rate band because we've allowed the debt to go up so much um, that that it's going to be hard to you know they're going to have to keep them low to make that debt manageable, and then. The next, the next shock that comes along, they're going to go negative, as I said earlier. So, I think it's just sort of inevitable. Um, that's where we're going. And, and look, there is precedent around the world. Bank of Japan's kind of done it, uh, ECB, et cetera. So, um, <laughs> well, Japan's never say the never. Longest, right? So, yeah, that's right. And they still haven't got the, got dug the way out again. No. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think it's just a fait accompli. And it took, you know, it took me a number of years to actually come come across that conclusion. So, um, you know. And and now and now I'm there. I'm like, oh well, it is what it is. So uh, <laughs> sort of stop worrying about it. But um, and now I kind of just eat popcorn on the side and watch it. But there's another observation, and that is, there is a point at which the size of the debt, particularly consumer debt, is so big that it actually starts pulling money out of consumption. Right. So, so the old argument was, well, if you increase the wealth effect, people will spend more, and they'll because they're going to spend more, they're going to actually stoke the economy, and it'll grow. You know, and and, and consumer expenditure is a large proportion of our economy. It's even more so in the U.S. But there's a there's a crossover point where that no longer is true because the amount that's going to supporting debt is effectively sucking the air out of everything else. Yeah, and obviously, as interest rates rise, even by a little bit, we're going to get less disposable income. So, so at the moment, um, household consumption uh, count well on average accounts for about fifty five percent of the economy. So it's the biggest driver. Um, so you know, fluctuates can go up to fifty eight, go down to fifty two, but it's around about fifty five on average. Um, so you know, we, we, we've got a situation where in the last year or so, we've had obviously massive interest rate cuts and all the stimulus, etc. So households are washed with cash um, at the moment, but. There's no more, well, at the moment, um, never say never, things could change. But right now, there isn't any any more sort of household stimulus on the card. So I think this year is going to be the year where households erode those massive savings that, they, that they've that they accumulated. Mm. And, and, and that'll keep the economy going along okay this year. And just to point but on then, that, the distribution is very important to understand, right? It's not equally spread across all households. Oh, it'd right? be the rich mostly. Yeah. It's the top 15, 20, 25%. So... Basically, if you think of it as a sort of a you know distribution curve, it's sort of like that with a lot at the top end, but there are a whole lot of people with less than a month's savings anywhere, and a lot of debt. Yeah, for sure. That's and, the and, group and, that I see is, as being the most at risk. Oh, absolutely, and and um, and you can sort of see that the way the stimulus was distributed. So you know, it did a lot of that actually went to the the top end of town. So um, yeah, it, no doubt the. Uh, People at the higher end of the tax spectrum would have would have accumulated most of those savings, um, but even so, I think I think there's you know there's, there's a fair bit of household savings in there to keep us going for a while. But I guess towards the end of the year, it'll be interesting to see what happens because if we do get some mortgage, well, mortgage rates are going to rise regardless. Fixed rates are already going up, uh, and Gareth Ed, uh, one of my buddies at CBA, um, he put up a really good chart and he made the argument that even if we had no you know, interest rate rises from the RBA. We're going to have a whole bunch of people who will roll off their two to three year fixed mortgages, yep. sort of starting next year, the year after, and they're going to suddenly reset at a much higher rate. Um, you know, whether that's that to go, they they got a two percent fixed rate and they got to go to three percent variable, or they got to try and get another fixed, which is a lot higher. So, 
It's a little, it reminds me a little bit of the financial crisis in the US when they had these sort of adjustable rate mortgages. Um, was that them? The, the ARM ones, which were uh, a period of time, they got like this teaser rate, which was really low. And then, but those expired after a very, well, couple of years. And then suddenly they got ratcheted up to this higher rate. High rate. And we're kind of going to have a similar kind of, I mean, much smaller degree, obviously, but um, there's going to be a sizable number of people who got these really, really cheap fixed rates that were then going to suddenly ratchet up to you know, two to three year fixed rates who are going to get, who, who could, could get a bit of a shock when those reset in a year's time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I'm watching that very closely through my surveys. And again, I, I see that those, those situations. I'd also make the other point. There are a number of people who are mortgage prisoners. They're on higher rate mortgages than the best in the market, but they can't swap to the cheaper ones. Is, is that because they're self-employed, or they're uh, or they're on these? Uh, they've got Lo- uh, loan-to-value ratios or yep. um, incomes under pressure. You know the various parameters that are used. Because if you, if you go back to the start of COVID, the banks were very generous in being able to move people onto different rates and turning them into interest only and all those sorts of things, right? And they actually saved a whole lot of people getting into really deep pressure through through that COVID cycle. I'm not seeing that same generosity now. In fact, no. I'm seeing precisely the opposite. I'm now seeing banks just quietly whispering to these households under pressure, look, you're, you're basically along these lines, your, your financial profile has changed. The best thing you can do is to sell your property before you get into difficulty because you are going to get into difficulty, right? Yeah, because the banks were worried that there was going to be a massive volume of forced sales. Now now they can trip feed it, so they're, so they're not so worried. And, and in fact, that's a good point because I think we're probably also seeing that with the ATO, for example. So the ATO was very lenient on small businesses during the, um, you know, the worst of the pandemic, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And now that we're coming out of that, you're likely to see the ATO be a lot more strict and um, and they won't be as lenient going forward. So that, that could create pressures at the margin on, uh, you know, certain individuals, businesses, et cetera, who, who will suddenly have these, these uh, tax debts they have to pay. Absolutely. Now, um, as we sort of move into the last three minutes, let me just broaden the aperture slightly because there's an international context here too, right? Now, I don't want to get into the complexities of all the international crises that are bubbling on around the world, but but let me just sort of explore with you a couple. You know, the Russia situation is looking more and more shaky, and it's worth just reflecting that 10% of global oil comes from Russia. A lot more gas than that goes from Russia to Europe. Europe, so they will have an energy crunch, potentially. Um, we know that the price of oil is nearly 100 US, and people are now saying it could be, could be a lot higher. So even thinking just on these economic parameters, is that enough to create a significant economic shock here in Australia, Julian? Uh, well, I mean, it certainly would push up inflation and create this uh, cost of living um, pressures. Uh, look, it's probably too early. So I, 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 um, I won't profess to be an expert on what's going on in Russia, but obviously, if, we, if we're going to get a, I guess, more of an oil shock, and we're going to get petrol, petrol prices tick up above two bucks, um, I think that that's going to, that could hit consumer sentiment quite strongly. Uh, obviously, it's going to reduce people's disposable income. And uh, politically, it's going to play straight into Labor's, uh, you know, cost of living push, because they, they, they're... They've sort of hinted that they want to fight the upcoming election on the whole cost of living issue, um, and it's playing beautifully for them. I got to say, at the moment, uh, the way the way things are sort of, what, yeah, the way the the the, the cards are falling. Um, so I think it's going to play nicely for Labor, but um, certainly higher energy prices will push up inflation, and that'll, I guess, create more pressure on the RBA. Um, even though I think they should probably look through that because again, it's this important inflation issue and. You know, managing to trying to manage demand through interest rates is, doesn't really help when when you when, you know, when you've got an imported inflation problem. It's not going to fix the petrol price. Um, so yeah, look, it's definitely one to watch. I, I must admit, until you mentioned, it, I hadn't really thought about it because I've been kind of reading the headlines in Russia, sort of rolling my eyes, going, "Oh yeah, whatever, uh, just another global, you know, thing." Because it seems to be a Tuesday that 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 we get these kind of, uh, you know, rumblings internationally now. And I must admit, I've become sort of a little bit desensitised to it. But, um, <laughs> well, it's but quite... I also hadn't... Yeah, I, I, obviously, it's, you know, it's big. But, um, yeah, I, I, um, 
I don't know, I guess I'm just getting cynical in my older age. Well, uh, let me throw you a little cynical dust back, right? It's convenient that just when the Fed was thinking they're going to have to put rates up a lot, suddenly the oil pressure and, you know, the European crisis is up. And so maybe the Fed will say, oh, we would be a little bit careful. Maybe we shouldn't do too much too soon, just in case. So it almost gives them a, a get-out-of-jail card to stop them having to put rates up. Yeah, there, it, it is a coincidence, isn't it? <laughs> but um, yeah, at the same time, uh, yeah, I mean, do, do you think they're sort of uh, embellishing the, the the Russian threat, or is it? Uh, I've got no way of knowing. Yeah, I got no idea either. Um, you know, I talked to some people. Uh, I had a guest on some weeks ago who was arguing we're only getting one side of the story. There is actually another side of the story from from Russia. I don't know, but I am interested in the economic fallout, which I think yeah. could be quite substantive, right? But here's, here's another one, right? What about China, right? So we know the China economy is slowing. We know that the property sector in China is looking like a hard landing rather than a soft landing. Um, we do sell a lot of stuff. 35% of all our exports go to China. Yeah. Um, so is there a chance of an economic shock coming from that quarter? Oh, absolutely. I think that's been, a, that's been on the cards for ages. Um, and especially as, you know, China sort of tries to shift its economy away from just building stuff. Um, like, I mean, it's funny, but uh, Jim Chanos, I think, uh, when I first started doing macro about 2010, was sort of uh, making the same arguments. And 10 years later, they're still doing it. They're still, you know, they've, they've, they've been building like mad for a decade and, you know, probably eight years longer than I ever thought they would. Um, but yeah, certainly, yeah, and, and, and not just that, also China's sort of taken this, um, bizarrely have taken his COVID zero policy even now. Mm. So the thought on the street is that China's going to remain closed pretty much the rest of the world for the for this this whole year, uh, which is quite quite unbelievable. And, and that actually has ramifications for Australia in that our biggest tourism market is China. Uh, so at the peak before... Uh, the pandemic hit. We we got about I think it was eighteen billion dollars uh, just from China in uh, in in tourism exports. Um, now, if they maintain this COVID zero policy, what it effectively means is, and they discourage travel abroad. What it effectively means is that we're going to get very few Chinese tourists because when they have to return back home, they'll have to quarantine for three weeks. And who, who's going to want to do that? Also, um, with the COVID zero policy in China, we're going to have less direct flights between here and us uh, here in China. So. There is those sorts of impacts. Um, we're going to get less tourism in China. Probably get less students as well because of all the, you know, all the geopolitical fallout, all this kind of stuff. Uh, so that then also plays in the Australian economy because China again is our biggest tourism uh, market. We we got one and a half million Chinese tourists in, in 2019 before the pandemic hit, and uh, so that's going to punch a big hole there. We're going to get probably less students, and China are the one international student source before the pandemic hit. They are our biggest. They are the one that was actually closest to being a genuine export because only 20% of Chinese students actually worked in Australia. Whereas if you flip that around and say India or Nepal, it's like 80%. Um, so if we get less international students from China, we're also going to get less genuine exports from China on, 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 on that front as well. It won't matter as much for the labor market because they didn't work as much anyway. Um, so yeah, there's, no, there's all these issues um, with China. They're... Obviously, domestic economy is slowing down. Building less stuff means less iron ore demand, less coking coal, less thermal coal, etc. So, China's definitely one to watch. I'm probably not the man to talk to on this. My my partner in crime, David Lyon Smith, uh, follows China like a hawk. Um, the way we're kind of structured, MB, is I do all the domestic stuff. He does the international stuff. So um, he sort of stays in his lane. I stay in my lane. And um so you know I'd, you'd be better off uh, deferring to him should, um have him on sometime he, well, he'll, we should, he'll, he'll we, talk your ear off we should, we, no we should do that because he does uh, absolutely but but the, my point was that what happens in china doesn't stay in china right there ah. are there are ramifications to the local economy here and you know just to take the one example the, the china tourism that was so strong you mentioned that you know probably won't be as strong now and whilst no, we're seeing international visitors coming from the UK and from the US, and there'll be some, they're talking about a million over the next uh, little while, um, that's not going to make up because the average uh, person coming from China would spend a lot more than some of those 
other guests from other parts of the world. By the way, people yep. come from New Zealand, so maybe even less, <laughs> even less, which is interesting. No, and, and, and obviously a lot, a lot of those um, those visitors are actually working holiday makers, so they come over here with not much, like backpacks, mm. etc. Yep. But they do matter for the labour market because if uh, obviously you know. Um, they they tend to go into a lot of the slave driving industries. Uh, I like to call them, like whether it's uh, agriculture or uh, working at cafes, etc. They're, they're easily exploitable. Um, uh, we don't obviously have that with the with the Chinese students, uh, the Chinese travellers. They, they they come over here to spend, yep. um, and you know some of them to visit family, etc. As well, but they do spend big while they're here, and they are I guess genuine tourists in that respect, or genuine students, more likely genuine students who come over bring their money with them, um, support themselves with that money, spend the money while they're here, and then go back home or, I guess, stay on if they stay on. But whereas, um, you know, students from, say, the subcontinent come over here with not with not much um, and work like crazy while they're here and basically pay their living costs by working. And that isn't an export, but it is counted as an export, uh, perversely, by the ABS, because uh, the money's earned here. Uh, so... But that matters more for the labour market because they actually participate in the labour market, whereas the Chinese student doesn't or the Chinese um, tourist. So, um, yeah, there are all these sorts of uh, economic things. Um, the the loss of the, the Chinese has a bigger economic impact from a, you know export perspective, for sure. Absolutely. Well, um, an, another interesting um, little, little conundrum is um, there's an election sometime. Right. Within the next 90 days. Now, I guess one of the interesting questions from an economic perspective is, does it make much difference? You know, well, it depends. It depends if you like Pepsi or Coke. <laughs> um, you know, which one do you prefer? Look, look to, be, to be honest with you, uh, both parties have offered not much. Um, you can vote for the coalition if you want uh, ongoing corruption and all the stuff we've experienced, all the shenanigans we've experienced. <laughs> Labor's basically promised not much. Uh, they're going to be a little bit better around the edges on a lot of stuff. They're going to give us an anti... Uh, well, they said they'll give us an um, anti-corruption commission, uh, et cetera. And, um, but, you know, Labor's quite fairly, I guess, has taken a, a small target strategy. Now, um, you can understand why, because under Bill Shorten, they went to the previous two elections and announced all these policies, et cetera, and they, got, they lost. And, they, and the, the government used them as scare campaigns. This time around... They're promising basically nothing. Um, today they pulled out the old can out of uh, we're going to we're going to crack down on multi multinational tax avoidance. Now that's a guaranteed every election you're going to get that one because it doesn't offend anyone, right? You can say oh crack down on multinational tax avoidance, and you're not going to it's not going to impact anyone in Australia who actually votes because we're not a multinational avoiding tax, and it sounds good. So there are so there's no losers. What I like to see is Labor take on some of the harder issues like. Oh, right, guess what? We're going to implement those anti-money laundering laws on property that we that Australia promised in 2006, but it's shelved ever since. Uh, but of course, if you do that, you then got to go headstrong into the the property lobby, uh, accountants, lawyers, all the vested interests are going to come at you. Um, so, for that reason alone, we're not going to see much promise before the election. And once Labor gets in, who knows? Um, probably more of the same because, really. A vote for one of the major parties in Australia is Pepsi or it's Coke. You're not going to get that much difference. It's like 5% variation either way. You're going to get big migration under both of them. You're just going to get a slightly different composition of the visas. Um, but, yeah, they're all on a uni ticket. You're going to get much of the same with a lot of it. Um, just minor changes around tax. But it's, you know, it's really at the margin. Mm. So uh, I can't see a whole lot changing to be quite honest. And, and, and whoever, whoever takes office is going to, in, inherit a stink of um, obviously you know the inflation issues and uh, and rising mortgage rates fixed and and I think by the end of the year probably some variable rate mortgage rises uh, so you know that, that that's going to hit either party no matter which one gets in and it's going to be whoever gets elected's mess to clean up. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's going to be plenty of mess to clean up. I think whatever whoever gets back in, but I'm afraid that I share your view that the economic canvas hardly changes at all whichever side gets back part of that of course is that you've still got the same treasury structure the same treasury thinking the same rba thinking the same regulatory frameworks the ineffective regulators the captive regulators so all of that infrastructure still exists 
right? So it almost doesn't make any difference who's actually in um, in the lodge because effectively it's still part of the same machine. Yeah, it's the same institution still running things. You've got the same, um, the same three Ps from uh, Treasury that they keep promoting, which they've done ever since I started there in 2003. And my first speech from Ken Henry was the three Ps. And uh, nothing's changed except that they're... They, they seem to have given up on productivity anticipation now that there's pump population. So, um, yeah, they, they pump the P that doesn't matter. Um, and I, I, I know I bang on about this issue all the time. Sorry, it's very <laughs> no, front, no, it's front very of mind because it's <laughs> – well, yeah, because it's sort of, it's sort of the issue we're fight, I'm fighting right now because it's topical right now and it's the one that needs to be won right now. Um, and if I was having this conversation with three years ago, I would have been banging on about negative gearing. But, um, but that's sort of yesterday's war, so I don't even talk about it anymore. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, indeed. yeah. So um, – You've mentioned a couple of times prospect of negative interest rates, and, and it's worth just reflecting on that because, of course, the ECB basically has a negative interest rate between the banks and the central banks. So basically, they're giving them free money to lend, basically. All right. Now we had a term funding facility, which was very cheap money. It wasn't quite negative, but it was very cheap money, and of course, the banks have to pay that back in the next two and a half years or so. So that's one of the reasons why interest rates are going to go up. So chances are rates might go up then they may have to come down. I guess my question for you is negative interest rates in a retail environment seem to me to be very hard to do unless you can find a way of keeping people within the banking system. And if you can pull money out, that's what you'll do. So I've got this bit of a theory that central bank digital currencies and negative interest rates are actually two sides of but one coin. I don't know what you think about that, but I've started to form a view that this is quite important to watch. Yeah, I never thought about that until you mentioned it right now. To be, honest, to be mm. quite honest with you, uh, but yeah, it makes sense. I mean, if if, um, if you're going to effectively get charged to put your money in the bank, which is, I guess, what will happen, um, you might try and put it in Bitcoin or some other, you know, some other unregulated or you know shadow system. Yep. Uh, so, so how do the banks? So, so how do they do? What, what do they do to fight that? Be interesting to see. Do you know what what, what they've done in um, in Europe or? Well, These other places they've been doing this for a long time. So there are there are very active discussions about central bank digital currencies, retail central bank digital currencies. No one is drawing the clear line that I'm drawing, but if you look at some of the um, material that's been put out, basically um, including from the IMF, they're all saying if you need to take rates negative, you have to find a way to stop people taking money out of the system. Yeah. Now, I, I fought the cash ban a few years ago because that was another example of stopping people moving money out of the system, basically. And if you are given a central bank digital currency account at the central bank and that's where your money goes, right, you suddenly you're in the system and you've got no choice but to work within the system. So I, for one, will be very interested to see whether, in fact, um, the... Treasury's work, which is currently running on central bank digital currencies, at all starts to mention the linkage between that and, you know, interest rates. And it's worth remembering, of course, that APRO is expecting all the banks to be able to handle negative interest rates in Australia yeah. within the next year. So That's right. this, yeah, is, they, this they, isn't they, a theoretical conversation. No, no, they, 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 they did that announcement about three months ago, I think it was. Yep. Or, oh, actually, I've lost track of time. Could bit, have been six bit longer months than ago, that now. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, yeah. So it, I you need inter, inter, in, interim solutions to be able to handle negative interest. Now, that could be fees rather than actually changing some of the ledgers, because I know that some of the old ledgers will be very hard to, to fix. But it is interesting that whilst everybody out there is talking about higher interest rates, right, the banks are worrying about, handling negative interest rates which is which should be the next um you know it might be two years time but yeah. it'll be the next leg down next like leg you down. say so yeah hmm. so uh yeah so the powers that be are trying to get ready for it because i know it's coming correct uh, and, and, and you can see you can see by the by the property cycle in the last decade or so we've had basically you have this situation where rates fall right, property prices you know skyrocket go up and then they increase rates a bit property prices fall and then you get this ratchet lowering interest rates, and then the, you know the cycle keeps going and going. Um, and if we follow that same cycle, well, then you're going to have you know one percent rise in rates, maybe one and a half, whatever. Uh, and then you're going to get a ten percent correction ish. It's what happened the last couple of times. And then you're going to get the they're going to have to lower it, and it's going to go lower than it was previously yep. for it to work, and for it's more debt to get taken off. <laughs> exactly. So the next logical solution is well, we're at point one now. It's got to go negative. Um, I, th I think it's a fait complete. 
Oh. And, and, and that was actually one of the mistakes I made uh, a year or so ago. I think it was. I thought we pretty much bottomed. Um, so I thought, oh, yeah, we're at the bottom. This is the end. This is like the end of the, the property super cycle. Pretty naive, really, looking back. <laughs> um, but, you know, now, now I'm a full convert to uh, to going negative. It just, yeah, it's, it's happened overseas. The, the, the precedent is there mm. and there's nothing to stop them from doing it. And, and the whole term funding facility was kind of putting in the structure to do it again. Absolutely. Uh, only oh. instead of charging, I think, 0.1% they charged, mm. they'll just give banks a credit. Negative. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, you know, the, the fact is that the term funding facility did what it forced them to do. It forced them to lend more, although, of course, you know, they've still got to make up the difference now. I've said, I said about six months ago, expect TFF version 2. It will come. Yep. Oh, absolutely. Yep. It'll come. And, and look, the, the, the big the big mistake with the TFF was um, it's not actually a bad thing in principle. It's bad when you don't have when you don't have the structures in place like macro prudential or whatever to stop the money from just going straight into the prop into assets, the yep. property market. Yep. So you know if, if they did a TFF, um, they had the macro prudential stuff to try and stop the going straight into property, and it could actually go to something productive like businesses and tradables. It wouldn't be so bad. But unfortunately, as we know, uh, the way Australia is set up. Uh, Basel rules, everything. Basel rules. I always say it wrong. Um, you know, it, it's just going to go straight into property because <laughs> that's, that's the way it works. And, uh, you know, and, and, and the chances of the RBA or uh, APA, et cetera, butting heads and actually setting up something so it doesn't fly into property next time is basically Buckley's and none because that's what they know drives the economy, yep. at least in the they, short term. They're all on the same side, unfortunately, the argument, which is uh, why we don't get any, any change. Um, yeah, so they go straight back to the well. Yeah, funny that. <laughs> now, as we come towards the end of the show, um, Jason, a little earlier on, actually put this uh, question in, and thanks for the um, super chat. Does Leaf think Mike Cannon's Brooks attempt to take over AGL would spurn a better outcome his logic makes sense. Public companies can't make decisions fast enough, but if he bought it, could change 20 years earlier. Uh, and I wanted to sort of segue that into the slightly broader question of the whole question of, um, you know, net zero, the um, question of renewables and all those, because it seems to me that that is potentially another shock, which is also worth thinking about. And I'm not sure that economists are really actually getting their head around it yet. No, no, that's right. Well, I mean, I, I, I want to say from the outset, I think, I think what he's, what Cannon Brooks is doing is really good, actually. Mm. Um, I mean, look, the fact of the matter is the way the how corrupt the political system and the corporate system is now is you're going to have um, the fossil fuel industry hang on for dear life and, you know, just basically um, you know, you're not going to get the pivot towards renewables, which are becoming cheaper and cheaper and is the future, let's face it. Even if, you know, an individual listener or whatever doesn't want to believe it. The fact of the matter is the world's going that way. So if the world's going that way, it's stupid for Australia to push against the tide. Even if you believe it or not, uh, you, you've got to go with the flow, especially when you're a sort of small to medium sized country like ours. And I think, I think what Cannon Brooks is doing is fantastic. And it's, he's basically a change agent. It's good to see a billionaire or a multi-billionaire uh, actually use his wealth for good, uh, which we don't seem to see too often. Um, so, you know, well done. Um, the, the other picture is, uh, yeah, there's, I think the shift to renewables and everything is going to be, it's going to create, you know, some quite big tra uh, transitional costs and, and impacts, which um, whether that's, you know, entire coal mining towns suddenly going the way of Detroit and shutting down um, and the huge dislocation that's going to happen, you're going to have to retrain all these workers or, um, you know, more at the macro level, you're going to, you know, potentially some short term energy spikes, price spikes or whatever. Um, there's going to be a lot of transitional costs while, you know, the world sort of pivots towards cleaner fuel sources. And, um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think anyone's really got their heads around it yet. And I still think a lot of it's unknown. And it's probably going to punch us in the face. Um, and it's going to be one of those things we're just going to have to be be like a hurdler. you just got to jump over the hurdles when they come. Um, and, yeah, definitely it's underappreciated. I certainly haven't appreciated all the, you know, costs that's involved with all this sort of stuff. Um, it's quite a, you know, it's just so big. And uh, I think that's half the problem. And, and, you know, as I sort of think about it, I've always thought about what happens with a finite set of resources, all right? We, we are running up against all sorts of limits. 
Um, and some of those are financial, some of those are actually physical. Um, some of those are population related and of course the population growth is moving around all over the place. In fact, in many Western countries the populations are actually shrinking rather, rather than growing. So there's some interesting dynamics there. But, you know, it, it, it's like we're nibbling at the edge of the problem but not actually getting to the heart of the problem. And unfortunately the runway is getting shorter and shorter. So, to my mind, um, there's a huge set of economic questions over the hill that nobody really wants to touch. Yeah, and, and, and let's face it, we're always, you know, uh, economists, policy makers, etc. We all, everyone, pretty much thinks in the short term. So they, or you know, to, to a lot of people, the long term is like three years, and it's not really three years. It's more like you know, at least ten plus is the long term. But very few people think in that way. The, the, the politicians think in terms of an electoral electoral cycle, and because of the twenty four seven media landscape these days, they're often thinking a twenty four hour cycle. <laughs> um, so, you know, because of that. These sort of bigger picture things never get thought of, but, but um, yeah, I, look, I got to admit, I do like what Kenan Brooks has done. <laughs> yeah, um, he's kind of just thrown a thrown a cat among the pigeons here, and 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 I'd love to see. Dave and I often talked about how how good it would have been for. Um, so so Dave's Dave's been writing about the natural gas catas- catastrophe we've got in Australia, where, despite being one of the biggest natural gas exporters in the world, or the biggest at the moment. Uh, having these abundant resources, we pay such high costs because uh, effectively we're getting gouged by the gas companies who set up these export terminals and they're effectively selling our gas cheaper overseas and, we'll, and, we'll, and price discriminating against us and making us pay more. And um, yeah, we sort of, uh, a couple of years ago with this discussion, say, well, why, why doesn't the government just nationalise, you know, a massive gas producer like Santos or something? Let's just spend the $5 billion or whatever the market cap is, buy them out, nationalise it, we can have this government run gas producer to put competitive pressure against the rest. Um, you know, I'd love to see those sorts of things. And Cannon Brooks is kind of doing that on off his own bat. Like the government's not going to do it. Um, and he's just gone in and said, look, I'm a rich guy. Uh, he's obviously got more money than he can ever know how to spend. But unlike a lot of billionaires, he actually wants to try and put it to good. And uh, he's putting his money where his mouth is and he wants to, you know, basically knock out, knock out this, um, you know, gigantic coal fire plant and uh good on him he's he, he's a he's a sort of he's a he's a change agent and you know when you've got a sort of corrupt political system a political economy um those are the sort of guys you need they they're kind of untouchable you or i can't do it we don't have the influence we don't have the money and we need to i guess we we don't have that fu money he does have that fu money and he can do this sort of stuff and uh good on him and what I quite like about it is, you know, it's not ideological. It's actually just logical. Oh, it's absolutely logical. It's 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 it's, it's great, and, and and you know, it's a sort of discussion you don't get if you leave it to the politicians, because they're always you know murdering these uh, vested interests who are pulling the strings, and you know, all, all the lobbyists, all the you know fossil fuel lobbyists and business lobbyists and everyone else who who will basically won't let them do it or. Um, you know, politicians are probably on the take. They're probably being guaranteed these cushy jobs post post uh, post their political terms. But uh, you know, Mike Cannon Brooks, as I said, has got this fu money, and he can just go in there and you know do it Enjoy. on our behalf. And um, and nobody, you know, he, he's basically untouchable because he's he, he's too big to well, not too big to fail, but uh, too big to touch. Absolutely. Well, it's coming... a great change agent. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it's, we'll watch how that runs because I think it's a really in- innovative and interesting um, suggestion. And it's certainly we need more of that if we're going to get out of the hole we're, we're in. I think. Yeah, um, there's sort of this, you know, sort of left field thinking with backed by money though. Absolutely. Like you need money, you can't just have the thinking. You got yeah. to have the the financial, and he's got it. He's yeah. got both. He's so got, he's got uh, the good weight on behind him. Yeah. Yeah. So look, we've touched on a, a whole bunch of different economic threats and you know things that might actually um play out might not of all the things we've touched on which is the one that you think is we should be most fearful of oh, man, that's, a, uh, uh, that's a big question look um uh, probably the biggest shock is the one you don't see right so you know this uh, what was it saying there's the known knowns the rums the known unknowns, the unknown unknowns. And- yeah, that's yeah. it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. I mean, look, you know, you obviously can't be afraid of them because you don't know they're there. But, mm. but like, basically, the, the things that always get you are the stuff you don't see coming, right? So, financial crisis, 2007. Um, 
you know, we've just had the COVID pandemic. What's going to be the next thing? Uh, there's, you know, it's going to be something. Hopefully, it's not a war. Like, that's the one I really hope it's not. Like, I'd hate to see a, you know, full-scale war of some kind. That'd be, um, you know, we, we've, we've been quite fortunate in our lifetimes not to um, have to experience that. Uh, you know, um, not to the degree that, you know, say my grandparents did. And uh, that's the number one thing I don't want to see. But um, it'll probably be something you don't even see. And um, in terms of stuff you can see, oh, man, where do you start? Uh, I guess the thing that would worry me the most is get back on this war theme would be some kind of conflict with China. Um, where Australia's like pulled in and we've got to like, you know, we, I don't know, China invades Taiwan or something and, and we've got it and we, we get sucked into this kind of war with China and, you know, that kind of thing. I, I, I hope to God that doesn't happen. And that's the thing that I guess worries me the most. Um, whether or not it will happen, I don't know. Uh, hopefully not. Um, all, all the other stuff like, you know, rising interest rates and all stuff, it's, you know, who cares, really, in the scheme of things. It, it, it's not that big a deal. Rates will go up a bit. Property prices will fall. We'll have the economy will slow. We'll go through a bit of a you know a bit of a downturn. The RBA will cut back to the races. Um, you know we've we've already been through that a number of times. Um, it'll create a bit of you know short term unemployment etc. Um, but in the big scheme of things, it's not a it's not something to really worry about. Um, you know some sort of armed conflict is or another worse global pandemic or something. I don't know. So, those are the sorts of things that uh, that are likely to, you know, come and really, you know, knock the daylights out of you. So that that's the sort of stuff I'd be more worried about. But this is just speculation. I've got no idea if it's going to come, when it's going to come, um, how bad it's going to be. Uh, I guess just wait and see. <laughs> it's a bit of a cop-out answer, but I guess no, I don't no, mean, no. I, don't I mean, really it, mean. It, 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 you know, I was going through the same sort of logic to say, well, you know, all these things are out there, you know, how real are they and what are the consequences? And, you know, there are some universal truisms that still seem to be there. But, you know, the one I'm thinking about is if, in fact, we are starting to see a shaping of a new global order such that the power of the US and the US dollar starts to atrophy, and I think there's enough evidence to suggest that may be happening, and there are other forces now beginning to, you know, exert more more force. I just wonder whether, in fact, one of the biggest risks is this whole, you know, you know, the fiat currency and everything else, you know, whatever you want to call it. But but the, the power of the dollar has been there for a long, long time. What happens if that dissipates, and would that actually shake things up? Yeah, it could. I mean, we've been, the whole global economic system's been built around that since uh, what Bretton Woods. Um, when was that? Nineteen. 19- 50s, I think. I can't remember. But um, yeah, I mean, basically for all of our lifetimes, the US dollar has been effectively the uh, the global standard. So what happens if if that changes? Um, it's a good question. I, I mean, you know, until, until now, I haven't really thought about thought about that deeply because it hasn't sort of been on the radar. I mean, there's, there's obviously been discussions about the you know, US losing its supremacy for a long, long time. Um, but the US dollar is still seen as the, you know, de facto global currency. It hasn't really changed. The euro hasn't surpassed it. The Chinese one hasn't. So, um, but definitely, you know, maybe over a 10-year period, they could change. Um, especially if we, especially if we end up with, um, you know, if we have another couple of periods like the, the, the Trump administration or whatever, where we have this kind of declining empire type thing that's, that's gone on in America uh, over recent years. Who knows how long that can last? Um, certainly under... I don't get political here. I, I don't really care about US politics, but certainly under the Obama administration, they seem to be a lot more... Um, you know, it, the US seem to get back its global mojo, I guess. And under Trump, it's lost that a bit. And I think under Biden, it's, it's, it's a little bit rudderless again. So hopefully there aren't too many more electoral terms. You don't have another te- decade like the last decade we've had. <laughs> no. Um uh, I yeah, I wish we thinking. I've got this theory that part of our issue, both here and other places around the world, is the electoral cycle. Because there are too many short-term decisions being taken, and some of the longer-term things that should be being thought about are just pushed over the hill. Right. So that's oh, that's, to- that's 
that's politics 101. Yeah. I, I think, uh, you know, and I think three-year electoral cycles in Australia is, you know, probably makes it even worse. Mm. Uh, although, actually, I don't know. Can you imagine, would you want another year of the current mob? Uh, if it was four years, I don't know. But um, <laughs> Would it make much difference? No, no, it wouldn't. It's Pepsi Coke. So, you know, just, yeah, slightly different sugar content and whatever. But, um, yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, I think this whole modern, uh, I think the birth of the internet, like the internet's great. You know, here we are, you're in uh, close to Sydney, I'm in Melbourne, we're having a chat. Uh, we've got all these people listening. I work from home, I've been doing it for 10 years. You know, I'm a massive proponent of the internet. I make a living off the internet. I love the internet. But the one thing it's done, and there's no doubt about it, is it's definitely facilitate the 24-7 news cycle. And I think that's actually um, corroded policy making. A lot of a lot of extent because everything now is just about managing the news cycle. It's not about policy anymore. And I think if you go, if you went back to the 1980s when it was just like a few print medias and um, and it was just you know sort of earlier simpler times, you actually got better policy uh, because there was less noise. And now there's just so much noise that you the whole like political systems across the world now just can't handle it. And everything's just short-termism. There's always, you know, gotcha-ism. Um, you know, anyone who slips up and says the wrong thing, then they're cancelled. Uh, you know, it's just kind of, um, it's kind of makes it impossible to do anything these days, I think. And it's one of the downsides of the modern, you know, the modern technology. But on the upside, then, you also can get alternative voices like, uh, like, you know, like we've got. So there's lots of goods and bads. But... Um, I think one of the collateral damages has been the quality of policy making. I think part of that is the 24-7 news cycle. I think that's actually a very interesting observation. And uh, as we come to the end, you know, I'll rem remind people that um, towards the end of the Roman Empire, right, it was all about bread and circuses, right? It was all about, you know, keeping people entertained and, uh, and a lot of the stuff that should have been thought about wasn't being thought about. I worry that we are... <laughs> in a somewhat similar mode now where we're, we're, we're chasing those short-term, you know, stories and things, but some of these big picture issues that we've touched on tonight aren't getting the attention they deserve. And we have a lot of partisan common commentators and people who are, are called economists but actually are very much um, protagonists for a particular point of view, not necessarily propped up by anything much underneath is part of the problem. And that, for yeah. me, is, is, is you know, the, the, the emperor has no clothes sort of conversation. When you actually stand back and think about it, um, the quality of the debate, the quality of the issues that are being explored and, and the myopic um, view of many people is symptomatic of a deeper concern that I, uh, that I have. And I think, you know, the social media and the internet is part of it, but I think it's deeper than that. I think it's a, there's a philosophical problem as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. It, it, it all feeds in, I think... Um you know, one 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 thing um, perpetuates the other. So, yeah, it's sort of self-reinforcing, unfortunately. <laughs> uh, but but I mean, look, you know, I never would have thought that I'd look back on the Howard days and say, man, those were the good old days. Because yes. uh, I remember, because remember at the time, the end of the Howard reign, I was like, man, this, you know, I got to get rid of these guys. These guys are, <laughs> you know, some of the policies, you know, um, at the time I thought were pathetic. But if you look back at it now, it's like, man, that was such a good government compared to what we've had. Um, so we've been, just had this like uh, twenty year decay in, um, in in the political system. I mean, how many prime ministers have we been through? They just get punted out every couple of years, and you know, constant change in in, in leaders. And um, so, in some ways, like I didn't know what we had when we had it. I guess um, at the time, I was you know, I wanted better, um, and and now. You look back and you go, man, those were the good old days. So I don't know if it's nostalgia or what, but um, yeah, it seems like the whole political structure and system has just gotten worse and worse and worse over my entire adult life or working life. And uh, yeah, I, you know, I often wonder, was it, surely it wasn't this bad in the 80s. Uh, I was well, too young to know. But um, well, my yeah. perspective, and I've been around a bit longer, there was more intent to do things rather than just self preservation. And certainly, if you go back to the 60s, I mean, I wasn't alive then, but from everything I've heard, it was there was nation building. Yeah, it was. was absolutely. This sort of greater good, greater yeah. good type thing. I don't know if they came out of the war years when, um, you know, grandparents' generation, or well, my grandparents' generation, had to actually fight world wars and whatever that to come together. And then you had this sort of um, post world war uh, reconstruction effort, and there was this sort of greater good 
and um, the politicians and governments actually did do nation building and they were there to try and build a country. Um, now it's just like a grab bag of, you know, vested interests and whatever and get what you can. And, you know, all, that, that whole notion has gone out the window or went out the window decades ago, really. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, I certainly, it, you know, it could be me being romantic and think, dream enough about what I thought that what I think the 1960s would have been like, because I wasn't alive. I was born in 78, but certainly when you look at the economic statistics and you had an unemployment rate of, you know, 1% and you had, um, you know, there, there was basically a job for everyone who wanted one, and there was, I guess, there was high tariff walls, etc. But it was kind of a system that was very egalitarian. Everyone had, a, everyone had a house if you wanted one. Um, it was an egalitarian structure, which we certainly don't have these days. And it comes back to a fundamental question, which is where I want to leave it hanging tonight: is so, what's the economy for in the first place? Oh, the economy. The economy is there to you know maximise people's living standards. So it should be, or, or you know, um, my view is. This is, I guess, more about what should politicians do. Politicians should represent their constituents, their voters, and, and do whatever's in their best interest to maximise, I guess, society's well-being. Um, and in fact, that's what the whole Treasury framework is meant to be. Like we were always told about, you know, it's the, it's to maximise well-being, but the policies and everything they they support don't do that. Uh, it's it's often it's usually to support big businesses' well-being. Yep. Uh, Bizonomics. Um, so unfortunately, you know, we've kind of lost sight, but that, that's what the economy should be for. Uh, and that's why we should always focus on the per capita. Yep. I never focus on the aggregate pie. It means nothing. It's meaningless if you don't slice it down to the per capita. And you've got to focus beyond just GDP and these, you know, narrow things and look at the broader, you know, well brain framework. And, and I think that's a really good point to, to end the show on because t to me, having an economy that's actually supporting the welfare and the benefit of all Australians is what it should be about. What yeah, current and future, by the way. Yeah, That's absolutely. Current and absolutely, yeah. So laying the foundations for the future, not just um, effectively shaping for just a subset of people who happen to be perhaps more affluent and, you know, the people who actually are able to influence and have access to power. Um, and a lot of what I see around the traps today is just not actually in the long-term interests of Australia and Australians. And that's a problem. And that's why we've got to find a different way, I think. Absolutely. Leith, we agree. Thank you. I really appreciate your time tonight. And uh, thanks for all the, uh, the um, comments uh, in the chat too. Um, didn't ask, they didn't ask them any questions tonight, but I've sort of picked up a few as we went along. But um, I think we've covered the ground very well. Thank you once again. Um, we should obviously ask people to go look at macro business very important um website there where you guys do a really good job of um sharing the news uh, <laughs> before often before most other people which is great um, yeah and also po also poking the bear yeah uh, poking the bear exactly right and uh, we must do it again sometime and we should uh, we should get your um partner in climate crime on some time to do some of the international stuff too because that would also make uh, make good watching too yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Dave, Dave's uh, Dave's a lot better at that stuff than I am because he's, uh, he's 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 former editor of the Diplomat. He actually founded that, and uh, this is kind of his background. Whereas mine's more obviously domestic stuff. But right. um, yeah, look, you know, if, if you're keen on a, uh, a, a sort of budget um, a budget podcast or something like that to go through the budget or whatever, that'd be uh, that that's probably the next sort of big big event. Okay. Um, well, we, or, 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 the, or the next set of labour market statistics or whatever you want. Yeah, I, I'm well, always available. Just just put up the bat signal. Yeah, we'll, we'll certainly do that. And here. we'll definitely, um, um, we'll definitely uh, get there. And um, Aaron just asked, um, whoops, missed that. What's your macro username? Uh, <laughs> that's a good question. Oh, sorry. Um, I think I'm down to the unconventional, unconventional economist. economist. Yes. That's it. Yeah, sorry. Unconventional economist is my. Uh, so if you see anything that says unconventional economist, it's me. Uh, I should really. I've been wanting. I've been debating whether, whether I should just put my name on it instead. Um, I don't know. It's yeah. What do you reckon? Because David used to be houses and holes, and he's just now David Llewellyn Smith, and yeah. I've still got my old um, 
old tag, which I don't know if it's cheap or not. I, I liked Houses and Holes because it was just such a beautiful summation of the Australian economy. <laughs> oh, it is. Oh, mate, it was brilliant. Like, yeah, when I met him, he, he actually started his, his, his original blog was Houses and Holes, and then yeah. mine was just The Unconventional Economist. And yeah. I was like, what's this? And then it was, yeah, very funny. Like, it was just, even back then in 2011 when I first met him, he had the Australian economy summed up beautifully. Houses and holes. <laughs> and it's not changed. Lee, thank you no. very much. Really appreciated your time. We've gone way over budget and over time, but no problems. I think um, oh, yeah. it was definitely worthwhile. And we'll do it again sometime soon. Yeah, no worries. Thanks for listening, everyone. Sorry I babbled on a bit in a few things, but, uh, you know, we're just winging it. It's just a hot take. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I'm going to take you off air and I'll close the show. See ya. No worries. See ya. There you are, folks. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Very interesting conversation. Uh, Leaf is always great value, and there's so many interesting uh, issues that we touched on tonight. Uh, just to tell you that uh, next week I've got Damien Classen on, and we're going to talk about the markets, investing now or not. So it'll be an interesting conversation given where we are with the markets and everything else. So um, join us next week for that, and obviously uh, we'll be um, running um, our daily uh, recorded shows in the interim look forward to seeing you on those if not on the live show next week i want to say thank you very much for uh, sharing your time with us tonight and also for all the super chats appreciate those thank you very much keep watching and uh, just before i disappear i will just show you the doggies are sound asleep they've been asleep pretty much since we started so obviously economics 101 hasn't really um done much for them but there you go <laughs> <laughs> no probs okay thank you very much see you again soon and uh, this is martin north from digital finance analytics signing off cheerio